So welcome everybody. Welcome to this lecture in International Monetary Economics. We are in chapter 14 and in this chapter 14 we talk about some kind of concepts such as the covered interest rate parity or the uncovered interest rate parity. I have split this uh, chapter in two uh, parts and in the first part we'll cover 14.1 until 14.3 and the second part will cover the two last subchapters. In the first graph, you can see the exchange rate euro for one dollar over time. So this uh, graph starts in January 99 when the euro was introduced. And you can see that in the first time period, the exchange rate was increasing. And then in the second time period after 2002, the exchange rate de decreased quite tremendously. Uh, this plays a very important role in the first uh, case study. So the exchange rate seems to be quite volatile in this time period. Let's have a look at this uh, case study, which deals with the exchange rate exposure of one German company. The company has the following characteristics. Like the company produces in Germany and the cost structure is to 100% in euros. So the German company is paying the wages in euros, the rents are paid in euros and interest rate payments are also made in euros. The cost to produce one product is equal to 100 euros. So in case that the company wants to break even, the price of the good has to be at least equal to 100 euros. The company sells its products completely on the German markets, so that not only the cost structure is in euros, but also the revenue structure is completely in euros. How does this change in the exchange rate? from the level 1.1 euro per US dollar to the level of 0.75 euros per US dollar influence the business model of the company. So we have seen this kind of development in the past. So for example, here in July 2002, it is the case that the exchange rate is on the level 1.1 euro for one US dollar. And then like a few quarters later, in January 2005, the exchange rate is on the level of 0.75 euros for one dollar. So this is not a hypothetical question, but we have seen these dramatic changes of the exchange rate over time. Um, I would like to know how does, how is the business model of the company affected? How does it affect the profitability? of the company we are looking at. I suggest that I'll give you a few minutes to think about this question. Please stop the video here and think about this question. Thank you very much. How does this change in the exchange rate affect the business model of this company? When I ask this kind of question in my lectures, frequently a lot of students believe that the business model of this German company is not affected at all. So, students frequently answer, the cost structure is completely in euros, also the revenue structure is completely in euros, so that the business model of this company is not affected at all. Why should this change in the exchange rate affect the business model at all? This is a big question and we are going to look at it in a few seconds. You can see here that on this slide there is still some space. Let's have a look at the twist which will occur in a few seconds. Let's assume that there is an American competitor and the Amer American competitor pro produces this good in the US and the cost structure is 100% in US dollar. The cost per unit is equal to 100 US dollar. So in the first scenario, where the exchange rate is at the level of 1.10 euros per US dollar, um, the price has to be at least 110 euros so that the American competitor can break even. 
If the German company sets a price equal to 105, then the American company will be out of the market because it cannot break even. But in the second scenario, where the exchange rate is at 0.75 euros per US dollar, the American company can break even in case that the price is higher than 75 euros. So when the American competitor sets the price, for example, to the level of 80 or to the level of 90, then the German company will be out of the market because of the fact that the cost structure is completely in euros and uh, the cost per unit are equal to 100 euros. So the German company would not able to break even in the second scenario and hence the German company would be completely out of the market. So the main conclusion of this case study is We had a look at this company, which is completely based in Germany. Revenue structure is completely in euros, and also the cost structure is completely in euros. Despite the fact that it operates completely in the euro area, it is a case that also the business model pattern of this company is affected by the exchange rate. This is very astonishing, because in the first step we believed that this exchange rate change does not affect the business model of the company we are looking at. Therefore, this case study should motivate you to have a look in this chapter because you can learn a lot about exchange rate volatility and you can also learn a lot about how to reduce exchange rate volatility, how you can hedge against the exchange rate risk. Thank you. Let's go back to class. Therefore, let's have a look at the uh, graph with respect to the exchange rate. So you're familiar with this graph already. Here you can see the euro dollar exchange rate. But there is also a second possibility to quote the exchange rate. It would be like the dollar euro exchange rate. And when you read the financial press, then you would be exposed to this relationship here, the amount of dollars for one euro. It seems to be the case that after the introduction of the euro, first it is the case that this kind of exchange rate decreased. So the amount of dollar you need to buy one euro decreased and subsequently this uh, exchange rate increased over time. So in the financial press, you'll read a lot about the dollar for one euro exchange rate. So there are two possible ways of an exchange rate notation. One is the dollar euro quote and the other one is the euro dollar quote. By computing the reciprocal value, you can switch from one to the other. The so-called indirect quote gives you an answer to the question, how many dollars do I get for one euro? And here it is assumed that for one euro, you get 125 US dollars. The direct quote gives you an answer to the question, how much is a dollar? So we, ask, we are asking for the price of foreign currency. We are asking for the price of a dollar. The direct quote is at 0.8 euros for one dollar. Here in the lecture, I would like to use the direct quote because then we can talk about the foreign exchange market in the same way as we talk about the Apple market. When we think about the Apple market, we put the price of the Apple on the vertical axis and the quantity of apples traded on the horizontal axis. Furthermore, we have a supply curve and a demand curve for apples. And in the same way, I would like to treat the foreign exchange market. From a European perspective, uh, the foreign currency is a US dollar, so we put the price of one US dollar on the vertical axis, the quantity of US dollar traded on the horizontal axis, and then a supply and a demand curve for US dollars. Let's once more talk about changes of the exchange rate. Let's assume that in scenario T, uh, the exchange rate is at the level of one euro per US dollar and in T plus one, 
the exchange rate is at the level of 125 euros per dollar. The two questions are, uh, has the euro appreciated or depreciated? And has the dollar appreciated or depreciated? Second question is, by how much has the euro depreciated or the dollar appreciated? Uh, when it comes to exchange rates, um, it's sometimes a little bit tricky because the exchange rate, it is the relative price of two currencies. It would be completely easy to answer this question when we talk about the Apple market once more. In case that in scenario one, the price of an apple is one euro, and in scenario t plus one, the price of an apple increased to 125 euros, we would always argue that the apple price increased by 25%. So when it comes to the foreign exchange market, we could conclude here that the dollar appreciates by 25%. What about the euro when the dollar is appreciating? Of course, the euro is depreciating. By how much is the euro depreciating? When we want to find out by how much the euro depreciates, then it is the case that we have to switch from the one notation to the other. So we have to compute the reciprocal value. And then we are able to determine the relative change of this quote here. 0.8 minus 1 divided by 1 is a negative 0.2. So the euro depreciates only by 20%, despite the fact that the US dollar is increasing by 25%, the US dollar is appreciating by 25%, the euro only depreciates by 20%. From this little assignment, we can also conclude that a currency can never depreciate by more than 100%. So in case that one, val one currency loses its value completely, then the exchange rate would go down to the level of zero, and then the currency would have depreciated by 100%. But a currency cannot depreciate more than 100% because 100% already is a situation where the currency has lost its value completely. But suddenly, sometimes in the financial press, you can read about this relationship. So some journalists, they write, a currency has depreciated by 1000%. For example, with related to the Venezuelan currency, you find these kind of remarks in the financial press, and then you know that it is a mistake. A currency can never depreciate by more than 100%. But of course, a currency can appreciate by more than 100%. This is possible, but not a depreciation. Now I would like to talk about forward rates and hedging. So you know already that exchange rates can be quite volatile and that this can cause a problem for a company. And this is also the case in the next case study where we talk about forward rates and hedging. Let's have a look at the assumptions of this case study. There is an European exporter and the European exporter has sold a product to the US. For example, it could be the case that this European company is producing cars and one car was sold to the US. The European exporter expects a payment of $150,000 in one year. So it seems to be the case that the American importer cannot pay directly. Maybe this car is bought by an American taxi driver and this taxi driver doesn't have any money. So that the taxi driver promises to pay the price of $150,000 after one year, after he has earned some money from driving a taxi uh, in one year. 
The other assumptions are as follows, like currently the spot rate is at 0.7 euros per dollar and the forward rate is at 0.7105 euros per dollar. The European interest rate is at 5% per annum and the American interest rate is at the level of 3.448% per annum. In case that the exchange rate is constant, then the value of this $150,000 measured in euros is equal to 105,000 euros. We have to multiply through the dollar amount of $150,000 times the exchange rate 0.7 euros per dollar and then we get to the value of 105,000 euros. What is the risk in this kind of deal? The risk, of course, is an appreciation of the euro and a depreciation of the dollar. The European exporter receives a US dollar amount, so it would be very bad in case that the dollar is a weak currency, in case that the dollar depreciates and in case that the euro appreciates. So in case that, for example, the exporter expects an appreciation of the euro, to the level of 0.6 euros per dollar, then the value of this $150,000 is only 90,000 euros. Let's come up with one more assumption. Let's assume that the cost to produce this car was equal to 100,000 euros. In case that the exchange rate is at the level of 0.6, then Selling this good to the US would be unprofitable because the cost of production are equal to 100,000 and the revenues would only be equal to 90,000. But of course, when the exchange rate is at the level of 0.7, then this deal is profitable. The costs are 100,000, the revenues are equal to 105,000, so the company could make a profit of 5,000 euros in case that this exchange rate is valid. The big question is, how can the exporter get rid of the exchange rate risk? There are two different options. Let's have a look at the first option. And here we are hedging with a forward rate. The European exporter can use the one year forward rate can use the forward rate of 0.7105 euros per dollar and the exporter can sell $150,000 with a forward contract to a bank. So this $150,000 at a forward rate of 0.7105 is equal to 106,575 euros. So the European exporter would definitely make a, a, a positive profit from selling this car to the US. How does the structure of the deal look like? So today we would sign a contract. The exporter would sign a contract with his bank to deliver $150,000 after one year. The bank would agree to exchange the amount at a fixed exchange rate at, of 0.7105 euros per dollar and would credit 106,575 euros in one year from now. In one year, it would be the case that the exporter delivers the $150,000 to the bank. The bank would credit the 106 1,575 euros to the account of the exporter. What is really important here is that today the exporter and the bank are just signing a contract. It is not the case that cash flow is flowing from the US to the exporter or from the exporter to the bank. This is not the case. Today, just the paperwork is performed and in one year from now, then the cash flow will take place. So the American counterpart, like the American taxi driver, is paying uh, the German car manufacturer $150,000.
And then the exporter delivers the $150,000 to the bank and the bank credits the 106,575 euros. So once more today, just the paperwork and the cash flow occurs in one year from now. The exporter will get 106,575 euros when he uses the forward contract compared to 105,000 euros when he could exchange at the current spot exchange rate. What is the reason for that? Why is it the case that in our numerical example, like the forward rate is at 0.7105 and the spot rate is at 0.7 euros per dollar. Why is the forward rate larger than the current spot rate? Let's go back to the assumptions. Uh, the, these are given on slide number 14. Uh, until now, we have just used the current spot rate and the forward rate. We have not used the information related to the interest rates. So we have not used the information that the interest rate in Euroland is equal to 5% and the interest rate in the US is equal to 3.448%. We have not touched this piece of information at all. In order to answer this question, why the forward rate is larger than the spot rate, I would like to have a look at the second option, how to get rid of the exchange rate risk. Second option, we are hedging with interest rates. The structure of the deal is as follows. Today, the exporter, like the German company, the German car manufacturer, takes a US dollar loan. Afterwards, the German exporter is exchanging the US dollars at the current spot rate into euros and the exporter takes the euros and puts it on an interest-bearing euro account. In one year, the exporter will receive $150,000 from the American importer and pays back a loan and the interest on this loan. The exporter will also close the European account and will take the face value as well as the interest out of this account. So this is like the structure of the deal. It is the case that already today the exporter will exchange the US dollar at the current spot rate into euros and thereby the exchange rate risk is gone. There is no risk anymore that the exchange rate will change in the future in case that the exchange rate changes. This does not influence the profitability of the deal. Let's go into detail with respect to this second option. Let's in the first step compute the amount of the loan which is taken in US dollar. In one year, the exporter has $150,000 to pay back the loan as well as the interest. So the loan has to be smaller than $150,000. Let's discount the $150,000 once. $150,000 divided by 103448 the American interest rate, we get to a loan amount of 145,000 US dollars. So today, the German exporter is taking a loan of 145,000 dollars. In one year from now, it will be the case that the exporter will get 150,000 dollars and the exporter can pay back the loan as well as the interest. Step number two, this is a spot transaction. We have to exchange the $145,000 at the current spot rate of 0.70 euros per dollar into euros. So when we exchange the $145,000 US dollars at the exchange rate of 0.7 euros per dollar, then the euro amount will be equal to 101000 
500. The last step is that we put the 101,500 euros on a euro account and we earn the euro interest rate of 5% on this euro account. So that in the end, we end up with 101,500 euros times 105 equal to 106,575 euros. The euro amount of the first alternative is the same as with the second alternative. So it seems to be the case that the most important factor which influences the forward rate is the interest rate differential between Euroland and the US. So at one point in time, we ask the question, why is it the case that the forward rate is larger than the spot rate? The forward rate seems to be larger than the spot rate because the interest rate in Euroland is larger than the interest rate in the US. In the next chapter, we'll talk about this relationship and we will derive a relationship where you can see that the difference between the forward rate and the current spot rate is equal to the interest rate differential between Euroland and the US. Let's have a look into subchapter 14.3 the covered interest rate parity. In the end, it is the case that we derive the following relationship here. We derive the relationship between the interest rate differential and the relative difference between the forward rate and the current spot rate. So in this chapter, we will get to know this kind of relationship here that it is indeed the case that the relative difference between the forward rate and the spot rate is related to the interest rate differential. So let's have a look how we arrive at this relationship. We start with the following assumption that there is an investor and this investor can invest one euro for one year. And there are two investment alternatives. We can either invest in Euroland or we can invest in the US. When we invest uh, one year and we invest in Euroland, so we, we opt for the domestic investment alternative, we get one times one plus R. R is the domestic interest rate. So we are investing one euro for one year and we receive after one year like the one euro back, as well as the interest income, the domestic interest rate. The foreign investment alternative looks as follows. We are also starting here with one euro. In a first step, we have to convert this one euro into US dollar. And we have to convert it at the current spot rate in one over E US dollar. Afterwards, we can invest one over E US dollar at the foreign capital market and we earn the foreign interest rate R star. So this implies that we have to multiply through by one plus R star like the term in brackets. In a third step, it is the case that we have to convert the initial investment as well as the interest back into euros and we are using here the forward rate. So it is assumed that the investor doesn't like exchange rate risk and therefore the forward rate is used. Due to the fact that the two investment alternatives have the same amount of risk, it is the case that the investment at home and the investment abroad has to have the same payoff. So we can equalize here the uh, outcome which happens in case that we invest in Euroland and the outcome when we invest abroad. This is performed in equation one. When you look at the left hand side, you can see one plus R, the outcome in case that we invest in the domestic economy 
And on the right hand side, you can see this relationship F over E times one plus R star, the outcome when we invest abroad. The overall objective of these uh, kind of modifications, which will follow now, is that we arrive in the end at equation five, where we have the interest rate differential on one hand side of the equation, and on the other hand side of the equation, we have the relative difference between the forward rate and the current spot rate. So we have to do some modifications here and in a first step, we multiply through by one plus R star. So we put this term in brackets here on the other hand side of the equation. We arrive at equation two. In the next step, we subtract one from both hand sides of equation one, but not a simple one. On the left hand side, we subtract the one in the form one plus R star divided by one plus R star. And on the right hand side, we are subtracting the one in the form of E over E. So in the next step, we can write these kind of terms here of common denominators. So we have here one plus R minus one minus R star. Here's the minus one minus R star. You can find the terms here. On the right hand side, it is F minus E over E. Here we have a positive one, there a negative one, so these ones here, they cancel out and we get to this relationship. R minus R star over one plus R star is equal to F minus E over E. Now, in the next step, we can once more multiply through the whole equation four by one plus r star. So once more, we put one plus r star on the other hand side of the equation so that we have isolated the interest rate differential on the left hand side of this relationship. When we multiply through the right hand side by one plus r star, we get to equation four prime. So we have multiplied the right hand side by one and we have also multiplied the right hand side by r star. These are the two terms. Then one in one textbook, like in the Copeland textbook, he argues as follows. Consider the final term. It is a product of two rates, the rate of interest and the relative difference between the forward and the spot rate. Unless we are dealing with the case of a very rapid deterioration in a currency, in a hyperinflation, for example, this cross product is likely to be of the second order of smallness and as such can be ignored. So Copeland is arguing that the last term here, like this F minus E over E times R star is very small and therefore this term is close to zero and we can ignore it. Then we arrive already at equation five where we have the interest rate differential on the left hand side and on the right hand side we have the relative difference between the forward rate and the spot rate. The right hand side gets a special label. We can talk about the right hand side as the forward rate premium or the forward rate discount. So in case that the forward rate is larger than the current spot rate. Then we talk about, about a forward rate premium. And in case that the forward rate is smaller than the exchange rate, we talk about a forward rate discount. But in the first step, let's have a look whether Copeland is right with his remark, whether we are allowed to ignore the last term. Let's go back to our numerical example. Like we said in our numerical example that the forward rate is 0.7105, the spot rate 0.7, and the interest rate in the US is equal to 3.5%. When we multiply through, then it is the case that this 
cross product indeed is very small. It doesn't matter too much. And therefore, we are allowed to ignore this last term. So, uh, we arrived at this equation 5, which is called the covered interest rate parity condition. Sometimes in the textbook, you find it in the way, like as we uh, arrived in equation 5, the interest rate differential on one end side of the equation and the forward rate premium or the forward rate discount on the right hand side. In some textbook, it, it is a case that uh, they isolate on one hand side of the equation the domestic interest rate, then we get to equation 5 prime, like domestic interest rate is equal to the foreign interest rate plus the forward rate premium or the forward rate discount. So you can find both versions in different textbooks and different authors claim that 5 or 5 prime is the covered interest rate parity. Don't be confused with that. So what is this uh, covered interest rate parity good for? I would regard this kind of relationship as a kind of pricing formula for the forward rate. In case that you know the two interest rates, like the interest rate in the domestic economy and the interest rate in the for foreign economy, and you know the current spot rate E, then you can easily compute the forward rate. So I would say that this kind of formula should be regarded as a pricing formula for the forward rate. When you know R, R star and E, you can easily compute the forward rate. With respect to the empirical evidence, you can assume that the covered interest rate parity condition more or less holds. Um, there might be small differences between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation, but this can be ignored, at least in our lecture. We always assume that the covered interest rate parity condition is fulfilled. This might be different when it comes to the UIP condition, like the uncovered interest rate parity condition. Like in the next ch subchapter in 14.4, we'll talk about the uncovered interest rate parity condition, and there we will draw a big question mark whether this relationship also holds. But with respect to CIP, covered interest rate parity, you can make a check here. We assume in our lecture that this relationship holds. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you very much for attending the first part of my lecture. Thank you.